Hello, my name is Amelia, and I am a perfectionist. For me, maybe it's a perfectly flipped omelet. Maybe it's an immaculately made bed. Or maybe it's a pretty close to perfectly designed IC, and I don't get fired because I had to do a respin. You know what I mean, right? But what if we could keep monitoring our perfectly designed IC after the design process? What if we could keep monitoring how it's performing in the field? You know, keep an eye on it through its life cycle to make sure it's keeping up in terms of reliability, security, and performance? Well, we can. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. To keep up with the demands of today's advanced technology nodes, silicon lifecycle visibility is more important than ever before. In this episode of Chalk Talk, a first in this series about this topic, Randy Fish from Synopsys joins me to discuss how we can better gain insight into our IC designs through the use of embedded monitors and sensors, and how advanced analytics can enable a whole range of optimizations throughout the life cycle of our design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Synopsys. Hi, Randy. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Amelia. Exciting to be here. I'm looking forward to speaking with you and talking about silicon lifecycle management. Me too. So since we're talking about silicon lifecycle management today, let's set the stage. Before we get started, Randy, what challenges are we looking to solve here? Well, that's a good question. I'll give you a little background on the platform. So Silicon Lifecycle Management, or what we call SLM, is a platform that contains a number of products in various states of integration. And what we're looking at solving or the the challenges are really to improve overall silicon metrics or operational metrics that cover the full life cycle. So throughout the product life cycle, we wanna be able to do intelligent analysis of data that is gathered. So that could result in optimizations for the design phase, manufacturing, production test, silicon bring up or debug, and then finally in field operations. So improving the operation of the silicon in those environments. Randy, I would imagine that data optimization is key here and increased analytics would help us in a variety of ways. Yeah, that's a good point. What I'm showing here is kind of a loose, very high-level architecture. So on the left-hand side of the processor of the life is we're inserting monitors into a design. These monitors are inserted in the silicon. And then during the life of the product, again, from design and manufacturing to test, bring up and in-field operation, we continue to either gather information or use that information. And this information is all stored in a centralized format, a data lake or a set of data bases that will collect this information and store it throughout the life of the product. And then depending on what your use case and what your goals are, there's, there's different types of analyses that can be done. Could be done for design calibration during the design phase. If you're re-optimizing design points, you want to be able to take monitor information. It could be during silicon bring up or, or new product introduction where you're ramping on a new process node or you're ramping a new product and new test environment or new test vectors, being able to find what the yield limiters are or during production test and and you're looking at overall test efficiencies or operational efficiencies at your OSAT or across the manufacturing chain or in system or or what we call in field where you're really gathering information during the life of the product. It's a chip, the monitors are in the chip, the chip's on a board and the boards in a box in a data center or in a car, and you can monitor and optimize overall system performance like total throughput or power or even things like predictive maintenance. You know, being able to foresee based on analysis of many points of implementation, so you have many cars out there, and predict where failures may be. That makes sense. Now, Randy, how is Synopsys addressing these issues? You guys have made some acquisitions in this area, right? This is true. There's a lot of this which is organic, and I'll go into that. We have a product offering that we're leveraging and we're integrating into the overall platform, but we also believe in what you might call inorganic growth or or acquisition. And we will continue to operate in this fashion through investing in our current existing technology as, as well as acquiring attractive technologies. More recently, as in over the last seven months, we've had two significant acquisitions. So on the monitor side, what I have here is more tech and 
Mortech was acquired in November, so very recently, and Mortech is the leader in a commercial offering of PVT sensors and subsystems. They're a UK-based company, and the team has come over, and they're operating under the SLM team, providing monitors and developing additional monitors beyond the process voltage and temperature monitors. Another key acquisition was a company, Qualterra, which is based in France. They were a longtime provider and continue to provide high-volume analytics for production tests. Been in the market somewhere a little over 10 years. The acquisition was in June of 2020, and that team is really running our overall analytics platform. The growth through acquisition and through organic growth, they're both key parts of our strategy. Okay, cool. Now, Randy, can you explain a little bit about what exactly we're measuring and how that maps back to the metrics we need? This is a new area. So the exact use cases and the exact metrics, you know, we're still learning on and we're learning with customers and partners. But I think there's some areas that we do understand. So on the left-hand side here, where I have the column of measure, really, these are the monitors. So what are we inserting in the design and, and what are we trying to measure? What can we use to gather information? So there's some DFT and BIST, MBIST or LBIST and DFT is really a class of IP that's been in the market for many years and it's been extremely successful. And Synopsys is a leader in the test space and we intend to leverage that technology. So being able to do test in field and being able to use that information to do analysis and form conclusions is a key point of the strategy. PVT sensors, um, you know, which we got a big jump on by the acquisition of Mortech is a fundamental requirement. So being able to measure the electrical and environmental situation on the chip is, is key. Structural monitors, I won't get into too much detail here, but you can think about path delays or gate delays or, you know, set up and hold real in-chip situation. You want to be able to measure that and use that information. Functional monitors, which are more functional, the name implies, are things like bus monitors or transaction monitors, what is happening inside your processors, arbitrary signals, things like logic analyzers. So it's being able to, to pull together information of various functions on a chip. And all this will require a couple different things, but one is on chip analysis. Sometimes you won't be able to get the data all off, and so you'll need to be able to do some analysis on chip, as well as the data transport, which is a key part, IP to be able to get data off and control information onto chips. Synopsys, as you probably know, is a leader in IP. And then these metrics for all of these monitors are really things like improved functionality, improved performance, power, reliability, resiliency, as some people might say, functional safety, and security. So these monitors, we believe, will add value across this whole topic of metrics. Okay, so Randy, can we dig into the details of the Synopsys Silicon Lifecycle Management Platform? What all are we talking about here? So there's a lot of different ways to look at the platform. So what I have here is just kind of a hierarchy of the modules and how they fit together. And let me make a couple notes here. The light blue, things like TestMax, DFT, BIS down here at the bottom, that indicates that it's a product that is currently available. So there's quite a bit of the platform which is available today. And then there's other parts that we are developing and, and will be delivering over the next 18 to 24 months. If I start at the base, really what we're looking at here is the hardware monitor IP. And that's a rich set of monitors, but two of them that are available are the TestMax, BIST, and, and DFT capabilities, as well as more tech PVTs. We also intend to work as more of an open platform, so being able to integrate monitors from proprietary sources. You know, there is a strong legacy of monitors within accounts, so customers have been using their own internally developed monitors. We believe it's important to be able to open up our infrastructure to support those proprietary monitors. And then moving up in the hierarchy, there's two major modules. And really what you're doing is you're collecting information from these monitors. The two pieces here, one is called ALE, or the Adaptive Learning Engine. And this is software that can be running inside a tester. So we're working with the leaders in the ATE environment, companies like Advantest and, and Teradyne, to be able to embed ALE, the Adaptive Learning Engine, within a tester. And then as the device is under test, we can be gathering information from a device and eventually being able to form conclusions or do analysis and affect the test of the device. Another key part of that is what we call SLT, which is IP that gets embedded inside the chip itself to enable high-speed communication to the tester. And then on the right of that is ELE, and this is currently under development, but it's 
embedded learning engine. And this is IP that will be inserted inside the design for doing analysis and also just control during normal operation of the chip. So a processor-based subsystem. And then overlying all of this is a unified database, which is collecting information from ALE or ELE and maintaining that throughout the life of the design or the collection of design. And then you have basically consumers of this information, the SLM database. And if I look left to right, really what you're doing is you're going from an in-design phase to what we call in-ramp to in-production and eventually in-field. So during the in-design phase, we work with a product called Prime Shield, which is used for design calibration analytics. It can take real-time information or, or stored information from the test environment uh, as well as other monitors and do analysis to feed back into the design phase. Yield Explorer is for really new product introduction or ramping analytics for identifying you know, root cause of a number of different challenges. And then Silicon Dash targeted at test and production analytics or so for high volume production test, being able to gather that data throughout the life of a design across all wafers or all dye that are manufactured or all MCMs and being able to improve overall efficiency of the tested components and also to improve, you know, to find things like outliers and improve reliability metrics. And then eventually the grand view is to be able to achieve predictive analytics. So when the chips are in their normal operation, being able to effectively predict where there may be failures coming before it happens. Fantastic. That makes sense. Now, Randy, can we talk about some of those individual parts a bit more in detail? What about the Yield Explorer? I'll give an overview on some of the components, and some I'll go into more detail than others, given our limited amount of time. And so Yield Explorer is a Synopsys product that's been in, in use by a number of customers for 10 years. Very highly regarded component of the overall platform, and it's a mature technology. What Yield Explorer is bringing in is data from design, manufacturing, and test. So Yield Explorer processes the physical design information. You can think about, you know, LEFTF or GDS and OASIS, as well as various um, analysis capabilities. It all, also brings in manufacturing information from the foundry and also from the test floor, from the OSATs, various data that would be coming in from test results. And with that, it then can perform various types of analyses. It really enables the user to as the name implies, is really explore a design or explore a yield limiter and to identify root cause. So the logic volume diagnostics is all about really mining with machine learning for identifying root cause and then being able to generate failure analysis candidates. You can think of a small snapshot of layout that you could provide to an FA lab where they could then work to identify real causes of failure that could then be changed, whether it's in a fab or for other reasons, or in the design, make a change. Embedded memory volume diagnostics, depending on the chip you look at today on the high-end processors, you actually have tens of thousands of embedded memories. They can be very effective yield limiters in some case, but they can be very strong indicators of overall yield. So being able to have the tool optimized for embedded memory is a, a very strong case for us. And then finally, just general product engineering, where you're doing analysis and reporting of various component or aspects of the design. Excellent. Now, another one you mentioned was Silicon Dash. That sounds cool. What are we talking about when it comes to this aspect of the platform? Yeah, so I'll tell you, um, Silicon Dash is more than just a cool name. So Yield Explorer is used kind of typically during the initial bring up of Silicon and for doing very deep dives into identifying root cause problems. Whereas Silicon Dash is typically used more for high volume manufacturing. So where you're being able to gather data throughout the life of a design. So you may be, may be running thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of wafers. Okay? And being able to gather that information throughout the life and continue to do analysis across those data sets. The goal is really to find and correct issues as early as possible in the manufacturing chain. If you're having yield crashes or issues during the actual production test, you need to identify those as quickly as possible and affect change as quickly as possible. So we can track an individual die throughout its life. We have the complete history of when the design was initially tested, eventually all the way through its life. And all of it can be brought back to each stage of its life. And automation comes into play here, right? 
If you look at this block diagram, we have across the top in the blue blocks really a, a representation of the, the manufacturing chain. So you go from a, a manufacturing or fabrication, you go into wafer test, assembly, final test, or system test, and then eventually you're inside a system or embedded in a system. Silicon Dash gathers information throughout that process or throughout all of those modules. So we collect data or data flows. And then another key part is data preparation. None of this data is necessarily aligned as it comes in. There's data that's coming from all different sources and all different formats. And it's important to be able to align this data and prepare it and clean it in a repeatable fashion. And that's a very strong point of our automation. You know, you may have data that's coming from literally a hundred different sources when you look at the life of a chip going through production. And being able to have that represented in a coherent fashion is a critical part of our offering. All of this is pulled together into a data lake where they can provide visualization reporting and, and various interactive capabilities. And this also comes back and can feed back into the manufacturing or assembly and test process. And that is what we would call production control. So being able to send alerts or even control signals back into the test process and assembly process. So if there is a challenge, we can actually adapt on the fly or maybe alert to stop some sort of the phase of manufacturing. It consists of a lot of cleaning of data, a lot of aligning of data, and then automation of analytics. Silicon Dash is not a business model of software. Okay, so we're not following the traditional model of single-use licenses and, and users invoking a license. Silicon Dash is really a service-as-a-service service or a software-as-a-service model. And this has been developed this way from day one. So the Qualterra team from the beginning has developed in a cloud-based environment. So really what we're looking at here, we have Silicon Dash, the software, running within a data center. And that data center is gathering data across the internet from manufacturing or OSATs or other information. And then it's connecting to users via a web-based browser. So it's a thin client that the user is working from. And then Synopsys has typically been involved in the overall administration of this data center. And so to the user, really what we're seeing is Silicon Dash is constantly pulling data from the manufacturing. It can be pulling it real time from the, you know, the test floor, or it may be being pushed up in a daily batch or hourly batch kind of way. But this is constantly running without any sort of user interaction. The analysis is always being updated. Then when a user wants to step in and start to look at data or get a report every day or every hour, it's available. You're right into the data center and you can begin looking at that data. Or alerts and control information can be sent to the manufacturing floor or test floor. Key point of this is security. So there's a certification called ISO 27001. And we are very active in, in staying up to date on that. And we just received our certification again. Redundancy for server downtime. As you can imagine, you don't want these servers to go down because they're directly connected to the manufacturing floor. And that's an operation that you don't want to stop and start in any way, shape, or form. You want to be able to continuously operate on-premise and off-premise. And, and what that means is off-premise is really where you're using a third-party data center and your data is going up to the cloud per se. On-premises means the customer has a data center on their own premises or within their own cloud. It's a different type of business model than what you've seen in EDA historically. Definitely. Now, Randy, how does the PVT subsystem architecture come into play here? So PVT monitors have been around, you know, for a number of years. Some companies develop their own, and then there's been some third parties with various levels of success. So what was interesting about more tech and where we're going with the technology is PVT monitoring is more than just singular, I have a temperature monitor, I have a voltage monitor. If you look at the larger or more complex chips, you have true subsystems. You know, you may have dozens or a hundred temperature monitors or voltage monitors or process monitors infused across a die. And being able to manage that and having a consistent architecture or, or methodology for that is a key part of what we're offering. So today we have PVT monitors and sensors and controllers across a, a broad spectrum of processes from 28 nanometer all the way down to N3 or TSMC N3, which we're in development on now. And these monitors, have, other than the N3, have been in silicon and proven in customers. Applications are kind of broad. Anybody doing on an advanced node today is likely using PVT monitors. I, I can't imagine a chip being done on an advanced node that doesn't have monitors on them. And it's in one of the typical applications would be optimization for, for power and throughput. So, you know, dynamic frequency and voltage is a common application. So, you know, no advanced chip is really 
running with a single voltage throughout its life or a static voltage. It dynamically varies, and process and voltage monitors and temperature monitors are a key part of that. So are all of these in-chip PVT monitors and systems available on all of your process technologies? Yeah, no. (laughs) So for the most part... Well, this isn't all our hard IP. We do definitely have some, you know, RTL and control and logic of these IP offering. But a lot of it is hard IP. And a lot of the hard part of it is the hard IP. We are selective about where we engage, but we do have a, a pretty broad level of support across process nodes today. And we absolutely will entertain porting to new processes. Each process node, you know, typically may have multiple flavors. And we do test chips. We do silicon. So we don't expect, you know, a PVT monitor to, to simply design it and then fire and forget. You're actually taking silicon, analyzing that silicon to verify its operation. As part of Synopsys, we're excited. It's part of the Designware family. The customer base who's familiar with Designware has access to PPT monitors, and we will be part of those discussions. Okay, great. Now, Randy, do you have a real-world example you can show me? I'll give you a partial yes. Um, (laughs) We have... As you can imagine, customers are either slow or, or they refuse to share information sometime. But there are, in this case, a representative architecture. So I've picked one topic, which is automotive, which has a number of interesting requirements or carebouts. So this is all about in-chip variability. If you look at automotive, there's some classic challenges. You know, One is they have a long life. I don't know really what the life is of your cell phone, but I would say if I get two years out of mine, I'm, I'm happy. But you know, out of a car, you really do expect 15 years. And the life of the silicon at 15 years is much different than the life of the silicon in two years. Automotive applications are very demanding of functional safety and overall reliability and and quality. And what we find very interesting is the compute requirements, it's night and day. Over the last few years, the automotive market has gone from basically kind of a slow moving and, and typically one or two nodes or three nodes behind what you would find in the consumer space as far as process nodes to where state of the art designs now within automotive are on the leading edge process nodes. And they are not only absorbing the challenges of these new process nodes, but also just the complexity associated with that. Reliability is really a huge requirement. And by inserting monitors across the design, we're able to give this level of of deep insight and do analysis. And the benefits can vary from things like, you know, accurate thermal and and supply management. So being able to vary the various values of the, the voltage supplies, as well as being able to accurately measure thermal throughout the life. You know, this could be for aging calculations. There's pretty good models for understanding how devices age or, or how, you know, transistors age or, or how, you know, metallization ages. But you can be more accurate by being able to say, how long has this portion of my device been over this temperature? So not only did it go over, but how many hours was it over that temperature? And that can be used to better predict when that device might fail. And as you can see, you know, in this example, we put monitors across the die. Temperature across the die varies wildly, and it really depends on the application, but it's very important to measure localized temperatures. You have multiple voltages, and you want to be able to to measure voltages at various areas in the design, as well as process variation. Now, Randy, I'm especially interested in that adaptive learning engine you mentioned earlier. Can you get into that aspect a bit? I think, I don't want to be dismissive or disrespectful, but this is a real blue collar solution. (laughs) What we've seen in test over the years, you know, as designs get more and more complex, you can imagine, you know, as as the flop count goes up, the ability to test the, the devices requires just a huge growth in the amount of data that's provided during test time and being able to provide that into the scan. And so the bandwidth needed for scan has just been increasing dramatically. And traditionally, what that's done is is that's done through GPIOs that might be running at 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz. And what we're providing with TestMax ALE and TestMax SLT are a couple of capabilities that are tightly coupled. We believe that there's huge efficiencies to be gained in doing tests across functional high-speed interfaces. So things like PCIe or USB, USB 3.0, and that is what we're offering today. So instead of using traditional general purpose IOs for doing your, your scan or providing your scan through the ATE, is to provide these high-speed interfaces. So using PCIe channels that you already have and that you may be using during normal operation of the chip, but during test time, use these gigabit and above capabilities, serial channels, to provide the test information. Part of those requirements are one is IP that goes into the chip, which we provide, as well as software that goes into the tester or is hosted as well at a a customer site for processing the information and interfacing to the test environment. The other part of TestMax I'll I'll look at here, TestMax ALE, is 
since it's across a functional interface, it's available through the life of the design. And what we see is, is interest in not only being able to test the device when you're going through initial production, but also once you get it into onto a board and it's in the system in its normal life. You may have test vectors that are being updated. So you may identify something, problem areas in a design that wasn't covered by the original test, and you want to be able to, to continue to test parts in the field or to be able to identify root cause in the field. And so being able to do that through functional interfaces that are available on the component is a very key part of the overall life cycle story that we're involved in. So Randy, it seems like this kind of monitoring would be really powerful in a lot of different ways. We're just now really exploring where the high value applications are going to be. We've been in discussion with many, many different customers and there's interest I would say, honestly, across the board. So two that I've put up here of areas of interest, one is automotive, okay? So you can imagine we would be inserting monitors into a chip, and that chip is, is going into boards and boxes inside a, a car. And not only is it going into a car, but you know, there's fleets of cars. There's thousands or, or millions of cars that may have these monitors inserted. Being able to gather that data, either real time or near real time, and either process and perform analytics at the edge, or bringing it back to more of a centralized server. But being able to find trends in that information, it could be for predictive analytics. Maybe you identify some failures in the field and you find that they result from dye coming from a certain lot that were on the outer edge of a wafer. We have all that information. And that would allow you to then maybe produce a warning or you know, the worst case scenario is a recall, but at least to be able to understand where you may be having future failures in the field. And it's similar in the, in the data center. Data center is interesting because you know they're, they're challenged by a lot of the same things, right? Failures are very expensive in a data center as well. It's a much different model, but you want to be able to predict failures. You also want to be able to optimize your design and, and study how the firmware could be updated or the software could be updated. The nice thing about data centers, of course, is a lot of them are kind of self-contained. So transporting the data and getting access to the data is under control of typically a single provider. This is the vision over time. So we are in discussions with various customers here, but really this will take us you know, over the next one year to two years to deliver on the overall vision. Okay. So Randy, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Really, we believe that modern systems today and, and state-of-the-art SOCs being designed require ongoing management. There is huge gains to be made by continuing to have deep insight into the operation of the chip in its normal environment, all the way through the basically retirement or end of life of the component. For security reasons, even, you know, there's good reasons to study the part during its normal operation and make sure it's retired effectively as well. There may be data on that chip and other things you want to control. So what we're providing is really a comprehensive on-chip subsystem of monitors and sensors, and that is tightly coupled with analytics capabilities or software for doing analysis of that data throughout the product life cycle. Quite a bit of this is available today, and we're excited to be delivering more and more of it over the next 12 to 18 months. Excellent. Now, Randy, if my audience is interested in learning more about this topic, where should they go? Good question. I guess I'll start from the bottom. Is, is One is feel free to reach out to me if you go to the SLM alias at synopsis.com. It gets to me. And again, my name's Randy Fish. We also have some scheduled or, or upcoming Chalk Talks. Amelia, you'll have the opportunity to talk to some more individuals about some specific areas that we covered today. So I encourage people to listen to that. And finally, um, you know, you can visit the SLM or Silicon Lifecycle Management page within the synopsis.com website. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Randy. No, I enjoyed it. I look forward to future discussions and hearing from customers as well. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Synopsis. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of eejournal.com can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.